let's first of all uh, talk about Shiva, Shakti, what is it? Who is it? Uh, I'll hand it over to you just for anyone who's like really new to this conversation. Yeah, such a such a good point. So when we look at different forms of spirituality, there tends to be two schools of thought, very simplistic, the way that I'm going to explain it. There's dualism, and then there's non duality. And the lens of Shiva and Shakti falls in, into the latter. So non duality, what non duality explains to us is that the entire universe, everything that we can see, feel, taste, touch, the way that events unfold, us, our, our bodies, the stuff that we're made up of, nothing is separate and everything comes from the same, same source. So non-dual also is a real, like a little shortcut is to say not to. So mm -hmm. non-dual, everything comes from this one substance this one aspect. And within that aspect, certain schools of Tantra, not all of them, certain schools, a lot of my teachers who have studied Kashmir Shaivism and many who have been very seriously ordained in that lineage, I have not, but teachers I've studied with have, those specific beliefs then come into what I refer to as Shiva and Shakti and many other teachers practice and, and devote themselves to as well. And what that tells us is, okay, so everything in the cosmos, everything in the physical world, everything within us is one substance. We're not separate from God, God's in us, we're in God, that sort of concept. When it comes to that matter, that being that makes up everything, you can think of it like two sides of the one coin. The one coin is the non-duality. One side of that coin is Shiva. Shiva is consciousness, is the underlying principle of all that is. And on a very basic way for us to relate to it is generally connected to the divine masculine. The other side of that coin is Shakti. Shakti is that creative pulse that allows universes to be birthed, that allows people to be birthed, that allows ideas, plants, seeds, everything to come into existence. So Shakti really represents the way that matter presents itself into the world. And again, in that simple lens, Shakti is the divine feminine. The reason that these schools look at Shiva and Shakti is because we need the Shakti creation in order for us to be born. We have our underlying essence that Shiva that never changes that's birthed through the power of Shakti and through this journey of being a human and having challenges and having successes and all these different things that happen we like myself, we get stuck in our small humanness all the time. And these practices of Tantra, of yoga, the lens of even Ayurveda, like the science of our health, they all can allow us to calm the energy that runs through us, to allow ourselves to connect back to that underlying essence and it's through that journey that really deep spiritual awakenings can happen. And so the, the Shiva Shakti union is when that energy of Shakti can move up through the body and reconnect back with that essence of Shiva, which is a really powerful experience that maybe the smallest percentage of yoga practitioners will experience in their lives but it can be something that many different styles of yoga and many different aspects of practice can be going on the journey towards. Mm, beautiful. Thank you so much for explaining all of that. 
And so now I'd like to move more uh, focusing on Shakti and maybe uh, we could move through the different incarnations and you could explain a little bit about like the, the certain flavors that they bring. I, I love that you use the word flavors. Mm. <laughs> that's, such a, that's a really accurate and also relatable way to describe it. So Shakti, we sort of talked about it from a little bit of a philosophical lens, um, but to, to bring Shakti to be more relatable, uh, one way that that word, that's a Sanskrit word is translated is power. So it's that creative power that allows energy to be birthed. And Shakti has many different forms, many aspects of the goddess. You may see beautiful pictures and art that comes from India or many other parts of the world where the goddesses are depicted in these different aspects. So we'll talk about a few today, some of the um, main ones that people might have heard about or some of the main ones that um, people might be drawn to. And we might talk about a couple that um, I've taken, it's taken me a longer journey to relate to as well. We'll see, we'll see how we go. One aspect that I think is really relevant to, to start with is Goddess Durga. And Durga is the protectress. She is the goddess that is on the battlefield with the demons in the great texts, who is able to overcome the, the small mindedness of duality and ignorance and, and these different aspects that play out in the stories on the battlefield, but to relate it back to us in our day to day lives. Durga really represents a strong fortress of power. She is an aspect that uh, when you see her in many drawings and many forms, she rides on a lion or a tiger and she has she's dressed beautifully and she's really striking in her nature and that striking nature is really reflective of the strength that she holds and carries. She's one of the most probably worshipped and revered goddesses because of the festivals that also surround her worship. So it's very common um, multiple times of the year in India for Durga to be worshipped. And the name of that festival is called Navaratri. And that's the nine nights of the Divine Mother. Mm, so, of that. Yeah, so Durga is one of the, the main goddesses that's celebrated in that time. Depending on the style of practice, some practice nine versions of Durga that get very, very specific for each of the nine nights. Some of my teachers have Durga as the first three nights of practice, and then they progress on to other forms of the goddess. She's one who's yeah, really grounded and really stable in nature and one that I feel really drawn to at times when I really need to be clear in my communication and need to make sure I stay grounded in maybe scenarios where I might allow um, other people to take the lead or where I might put my own interests aside for kind of keeping the peace and those style interactions that happen sometimes with family or at work or those different things that come up in life. Durga really brings me back to my center and supports me in being really clear and really confident in how I address a challenge like that. I think so many women could benefit from working with her because you know, there's the conditioning that most of us receive as women to be people pleasing and to be the good girl and not to speak our truth so often. So I feel she would be, yeah, really beneficial at this time. Absolutely. In 
in one of the texts about her, um, and there's other goddesses referred to in the text as well, it's called the Devi Mahatmya. It's a really beautiful text for anyone who's really eager to learn more about the goddess. And one line in that text says, she who is most gentle and most fierce. Mm -hmm. And I just adore that line because she has the capability, the capacity, the strength to hold both of those so well. Mm. It just reminded me, I work a lot with Mary Magdalene and I did a retreat um, in the south of France last year. And my the, the woman who ran the retreat, she would like... I guess it was a mantra or something that we would describe Mary Magdalene was gentle as a dove and fierce as a lioness. Wow. Beautiful. Mm, and that very, really resonated with me as well. So mm. yeah, very similar essence. Mm, thanks for sharing that too. Another goddess that I have to mention and would love to share is goddess Kali and there might be some listeners who have maybe seen images of Kali without even knowing um, she is quite formidable she generally has a tongue sticking out pointing down very very fierce often there'll be images with blood when it comes to or fire when it comes to the art that captures the qualities of Kali and she wears garlands of a garland of skulls around her neck and a skirt of bones generally around her waist she's usually topless and quite striking especially again if we think as we said that culture that we have in western countries at times where the woman is meant or society says she should be passive and submissive kali would burn that idea to ashes in an instant without any hesitation and she is one that I always like to when I share her in yoga class or in workshop I always like to say we say Kali Ma please 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 come gently because she is very fierce and very strong but what Kali does which is really radical about her is she comes to us in our lives when we are going against our true nature and she will pull the rug out from underneath you really really violently only to help you evolve and grow and redirect your path i didn't know it at the time but she did that to me when I was 25 and living in the States and in a life that wasn't what I wanted, but I had felt I was making the right choices as a young adult and going to uni and getting a good job, quote, mm -hmm. a good job and <laughs> doing those things that I felt at that time were the right choices, but not for the right reasons. And Kali came uh, very extreme and she gave me a huge, a huge health scare. I had thyroid cancer at 25. Oh she pulled the rug out from underneath me. And that was the event that changed the trajectory of my life. And I look back at that now with the lens of this practice and this worship and, and the devotion that I have for the goddess. And I bow to Kali for bringing that change, because if it wasn't for such a big thing to happen, it wouldn't have been enough to redirect my path to where I am today. Mm. That's beautiful. And thank you for sharing. I think so often when we're in the thick of things, it can be life can feel so unfair. 
And it's just so inspiring to hear from people that have been through these, you know, what we'd classify as something very traumatic and to see it from the higher lens. And that can be so healing to so many people. And like you said, it takes time at the time. It was, I was going pretty well considering the circumstances, but I didn't have this view on it. And over time, I became more and more grateful for that event. And through this path of study and worship and understanding, I've now been able to look back at that time and see this as, see that event as a manifestation of Kali. And yeah, really humbly and graciously, I bow for the way that it was presented to redirect my path. Another form of the goddess that I would love to share, she's a bit softer and sweeter. So a little bit of a different taste for everyone listening is goddess Lakshmi. And again, she's one that we do see quite a lot if you're in the yoga space or if you go to kirtans and sing in uh, different group settings there are many songs and she's a, a very popular goddess as well lakshmi is the goddess of abundance of fertility and she represents really the beauty in the world she represents financial abundance, as well as the way that mother nature blossoms. So I always really feel Lakshmi at the start of spring, when all the little flowers are starting to first bud, and there's that warm, fragrant breeze in the air. To me, it's that soft warmth that really captures Lakshmi. She's also a goddess of radical self-acceptance. And that's something that I've really come to appreciate about her. She is really valuable for anyone who comes up against those really, really common narratives of not feeling like enough not feeling smart enough or successful enough or physically having any sort of limitations in how they view themselves, wanting different appearances. Lakshmi can really, really teach us how to accept and love ourselves exactly as we are. And she really shows that in her presence in when you chant to her and when you see images of her, she has this really soft radiating beauty. One of her other names is Shri and Shri means auspiciousness when it's translated from Sanskrit. And that really captures her essence and her quality. Mm, beautiful. Those three for me were really natural and quite quick and easy to connect to in, in all in really different ways. But um, I found Durga, Kali and Lakshmi relatable almost, almost instantly when I started reading about them. And then when I started participating in courses and building my own personal practice, my own sadhana with Shakti. There were two that, as I was reflecting for our discussion today, there were two aspects of Shakti that I really did not relate to initially. And I would love to share about them just to really highlight the way that our own psyche plays out when we look at these anthropomorphic forms, and then we try and relate them back to ourselves and our lives, how, how it can really play out. So the first one I want to mention is goddess Dumavati, and she is known as sort of the smoky goddess. She represents the crone and the widow. So 
images of her drawings and art of Dumavati isn't very appealing. I remember one of the first times I saw a picture of her. She's very thin, essentially skin and bones, older, not a very upright spine, sort of rounded, hunched, wearing rags. And in many images, she's depicted on a chariot or a carriage without a horse or without wheels. And she really represents that aspect of woman that's discarded by society. And I didn't want to not relate to her, but initially I, I didn't feel a connection to her. And I allowed that to, to be for a while. And as I was exposed to her again and again in courses and practice, suddenly I found myself in this very frustrated state. Um, there was lots going on where, where we live and natural disasters and really bad storms and power outages and all this time home and dark without company and just isolated and feeling the loss and the frustration within all of that. And I remember having about nothing to do and feeling all those agitating emotions and actually forcing myself to sit in practice. And suddenly her presence just came over me. And all of a sudden in this moment, I no longer felt alone. I felt that in this frustrating space and in this way of grieving what was happening and facing these mundane challenges that I was facing, but that were having a, a real impact within me, I felt the goddess Dumavati appear and really show me that where you feel that loss and that frustration, she's there and she's always supporting and providing an opportunity to sit with it and to go through it and to not always need to be rainbows and sunshines and feeling fantastic. That that aspect of living and that aspect of a woman's journey through life is just as important and just as powerful as any other time. Mm. And it was Thank through you. that that I really found such a love and respect for the wisdom that she shares. Mm. No, I, I love that you touched on her because, yeah, it's so obvious that we as a society, a collective, we've, we've negated um, the crone archetype, you know, and I think humanity as a whole is really, whether they know it or not, is really suffering because of that. Yeah. We're suffering because of that, because we've, we, we want things to look picture perfect. We don't want to sit with our shit essentially. Yeah. And yeah, I, I just love everything you've just shared there. I think it's so important. And I think because she represents this time approaching death, that's exactly what you said as well, Danielle, such a put it away and let's not think about it in my experience and in my people that I am around in, in the Western sort of mindset that we just discard the fact that we age and we do everything to avoid that and we don't talk about death and we don't prepare for death. And these practices, yoga, tantra, especially, and Shiva practices, Shakti practices, they're a radical stance against that to say, no, quite certainly this is going to happen. Hopefully a long time in the future to you, to me, to our loved ones, but this certainly is going to happen to everyone let us begin to prepare and let us begin to become familiar and become intimate with that journey. Mm. 
and she really represents that for me mm, and i and i feel like just taking the fear away from it as well like let it be like a softening that's mm-hmm. how i feel like a softening to all of it like an embrace can i can i love this can i be with this absolutely the last or depending how we go but one of the last forms of shakti that i wanted to share today is goddess sita and sita for me was also a goddess i didn't connect to right away she's a very loyal wife to lord rama and for anyone listening um they are who the monkey god hanuman worships so hanuman worships sita and rama again if you ever hear Indian chants. There's so many in beautiful Indian songs and chants and uh, different ones that mention Sita, Rama, Hanuman. So they really have a quite a loving connection. Those three, they're they're a family unit essentially, in the lens of Hindu mythology. And Sita, for me, again, how I grew up, where I grew up, she, at first glance felt very passive and my mind my ego aspects of myself came up against that and i didn't want to relate to her because of those societal and also familial upbringing that says being passive is a weakness And so initially I didn't feel this connection with her with with all the love and respect. It didn't come right away. And again, over time without forcing it, but just being exposed to, especially chanting with Sita, that's really where I had the shift in my relationship with her. I was um, up in Byron Bay at, at a course and it was at the end of that course and we were singing and we were singing a really powerful Sita Rama song and they get you know really hectic, really loud, really fast and the energy in the room and this overwhelming rush came over me and I was brought to tears realizing that she is so loving and she has the power of surrender which some of the other goddesses don't emulate quite as much as Sita. Sita is able to accept. And for me, I know there's been times in my life where I would push against something again and again and again. And it's great to stand your ground, but sometimes we might be losing more by doing that than we would be by accepting and surrendering. And and there's a time and a place for the energy of surrender. And Sita really embodies what it means to be loyal and loving and knows how to be a, a consort to Rama in a way that allows him to shine and allows her to stay whole because for her that service is so fulfilling reflecting on that as a as a new mom as well and reflecting on loving a little being and allowing your life to surrender especially in these early days to to them and to their care it's like a reflection of that sita quality of that ability to give unconditionally with no expectation in return. And she really um, has taught me that. Mm, that's so beautiful. Thank you for sharing. I think, yeah, that can, that's a hard one for so many of us because, yeah, I guess culturally we're taught to control outcomes, you know, and I've been on that journey myself over the past couple of months, just this really deep surrendering um to God and just putting things down um and it's been hard because yeah my ego has been resisting so much and I'm still on that journey I wouldn't say I've fully mastered it but 
I'm getting better at just letting go of things. And there's something so, uh, I want to say like, just, it feels like this massive release, just allowing to be taken care of 